So, good morning. Good morning. It's your first day in Amchip. Are you ready? Yes. So, my name is Bessie Lopez. I'm going to be your moderator for today. Just so housekeeping tips, this session is D1, called Preparing a Space to Think, Talk, and Inspire Others, an intervention for youth to move forward after a natural disaster. This session is going to be recorded, as you see our camera over there, and also is being recorded live to Facebook Live on the, the Youth Advisory Council page here in this table. Also, because it's recorded, every question you're going to say that it's going to be at the end of the presentation, I'm going to move around with the mic. Right now, I'm going to introduce our speakers. I have Gloria Montalvo, she's the Associate Director of the Comprehensive Adolescent Health Program in the MCH Division in the Puerto Rico Department of Health. I also have Marianela Rodriguez, she is our Psychology Consultant in the Puerto Rico Department of Health in the MCH Division. And we have five of our 20 youth advisors that are going to be presenting and working today. I have Camila Rodriguez, Carlos Trujillo, Kenneth Santiago, Valeria Flores, y Delian Colón. Also, yay, thank you. Also, this session can give you continuing education credit. So if you want it, you, after we finish, you can go to the registration desk and fill out the form. Also, please put your cell phones in by ready mood on silence so we can start. So now I'm going to leave you with Gloria so she can start. Thank you for being here. So welcome you all to this session. We are very grateful that you're here with us. Uh, so I want to ask you, have any of you been through a natural disaster? How many? Many of us. So as you know, natural disasters bring challenging events and are very, have very traumatic experiences on all of us, and especially on youth. So on September 2017, Puerto Rico went through the landfall of two potent hurricanes. Today, we will share with you what we did, the process we went through to address the impact of those hurricanes on the youth we work with. So our objectives for today are to define the impact of natural disasters on youth, demonstrate the youth intervention we use in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, and get you acquainted with the youth introspections compiled after the intervention. First, let me tell you a bit about us. The Comprehensive Adolescent Health Program is within the Maternal, Child, and Adolescent Health Division of the Department of Health. Since 1992, we view youth as valuable resources and partners, and we work two positive youth development initiatives. The Youth Health Promoters Project is a three-year-long project we do at elementary schools from sixth to eighth grade. Those volunteer students prepare themselves to share information and activities about health and well-being on youth with their peers. The Youth Advisory Council started in 2016, and we have our five, five representatives here. And it, that, it's the voice of youth in Puerto Rico to the Department of Health, but not only the voice, but their inputs and their participation in the policies of the department. Working for healthy adolescents has been our goal in Puerto Rico. The Department of Health is divided into seven regions, you can see there, and we have one regional adolescent health coordinator for each of those regions. Each of them have the work to implement the Youth Health Promoters Project in schools. In 2017, 
Nearly 800 youth health promoters were active in 68 schools at 60 municipalities. And we had our Youth Advisory Council that was, um, had 19 youth from nine municipalities. And then, So as you can see in the first picture, um, Hurricane Irma um, hit parts of Puerto Rico on September 6, 2017, and also the U.S. Virgin Islands. So as a consequence of this, many of our residents and community groups helped send provisions and relief to the, our neighbors, only to find out that 14 days later, Hurricane Maria would cross the entire island as a Category 4 hurricane and as the strongest, biggest hurricane that Puerto Rico has seen over 90 years. So Puerto Rico was left without power or water approximately for 80 days. Um, we all suffered multiple losses amongst, um, I can mention, our loss of lives, family members, friends and neighbors who just left the island, um, communication schools, and many, many others. Now in this slide, we offer some statistics, but we all know that they're not limited to that and that we all carry deep emotional scars that are unmeasurable compared to this. So for, for those we sur that survived, this one, yeah. <laughs> for those of us we, that survived, we were left with the question, now what are we going to do? When we finally got back to the Department of Health offices and what was left after the hurricane struck us, we began to think about how are we going to meet again with the using our Youth Health Promoters Project. We needed to do something to handle the emotional burden they were having and the emotional burden we were having as, as, as people of, the, of Puerto Rico, the health coordinators, all the staff. So we contacted our psychologist of the Division of Maternal, Child, and Adolescent Health, Marianela Rodriguez, to help us develop a plan of action so that we could handle all those emotional things. Thank you. Can you hear me better here? Yeah, because I tend to speak low too. Yeah, so they called the psychologist. <laughs> I had no idea what to do. I was suffering too. We were all in this together. So it was very complicated um, because as you know, and many of you have experienced natural disasters. Natural disasters actually are events that um, exceed our capabilities to respond. So we need help from other places. We need the physical help and the emotional help. And that's why it's so important for us to bring this intervention to you and to share it because you can all relate. You've experienced natural events and if you haven't, you might um, because they're very common and we need to know what to do. Um, in terms of the emotional response, because we got response, usually, what, what do we get after a natural event in terms of response, do you think? What's the first response that we usually get? Anyone? FEMA and all the practical stuff, right? But emotionally, we thought it was very important um, to stop and, and, you know, we couldn't go on with our program as usual, we needed to stop and say, wait a minute, what do we need to do here? Um, because it's important to know that 175 million children could be impacted by a natural, or are impacted by natural disasters every year around the world. And there are a lot of vulnerable populations, but the youth and children are specifically vulnerable because they depend on the adults on, for the reactions, for the preparation, um, and usually are not taken into consideration, and that's why it's important that how Gloria was saying, how it's important for us to have their voice here and hear what they need. And what is it that they need? What did they need for, so we can prepare for later also. And what are the impacts on youth? Like um, Valeria said, it's much more than the practical losses. They lost their friends, their school, 
um, their school days. That also means socializing. Um, they lost nutrition because the food was not the best. So that impacts their development as well. Um, so many losses, and the impact is great on, on youth. We can see the impact of trauma or a natural disaster differently. It manifests physically, emotionally, and behaviorally. Right? And here are some examples, but it's important to take that into consideration because we may see them acting out, and we don't know why. So it's important to know that. And so, again, thinking about an intervention, we had to somehow touch on these factors and prevent what we know is trauma and could happen. Because as we know, trauma is an event, that, um, it, comes, it can come after an event that is extremely upsetting and at least temporarily overwhelms internal resources. And trauma, where does it reside? Where does it stay? In the body. So we, need to, we needed to take care of that, and we needed to go deeper in the iceberg and try to get an intervention that would look into what was going on with, with the children and the youth in Puerto Rico. Um, and so what we did, which I still don't know how we did it, because we had very bad connection, but, and we needed to stop by the roads to get connection in the internet and look for things for interventions that had been done in the past. So it was very hard, but we were able to quickly um, find something that was done by, an, by the Alliance of Climate Education. It's called ACE. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but they, um, it's a nonprofit organization that was used in communities that had been impacted by hurricanes Harvey and Irma, so very recent. And what they did was uh, like a curriculum base for a classroom and what to do with children. So we contacted them and asked for permission to adapt their intervention, translate it in Spanish, and include it what we thought was needed for our youth. And this was, we thought it was very important to include some sort of mindfulness exercise because I thought, we thought it was very important to be present and become aware of what they were feeling and sensing in their bodies and what was going on through the event. And we also added um, a closure activity um, and try to make it a grounding closure activity so that they can, you know, they can use something later because we wanted to do the intervention and then have them, leave them with a message of hope, develop empathy, so, so we included those two. And what did we do? We first started piloting with our coordinators because we thought it was very important. Our coordinators and ourselves, we were all present. For that, we did it to each other because we also went through it. And we needed to um, talk about what we saw, what we perceived, what we were feeling. Um, we couldn't go on as business as usual and just we're back to work. It wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like that for a long time in Puerto Rico. So we had to stop. We did it with ourselves and our the coordinators and later with the Youth Advisory Council. And they gave us some tips on what to change and modify. And then as soon as the school started opening, which was in November of 2017, up until January, as the schools were opening up and the students were coming back, the coordinators were um, implementing the intervention. They always try to implement the, the intervention with the school liaison. So there's always two people there, just in case one of the students needed to go outside. These are students, are, are, these are participants and youth that could have seen family members died after the event. And they couldn't get out of the house. I mean, there were stories in Puerto Rico where they had to bury their family members. Um, right there in their house. So very intense. Um, so that's what we did. And what we want to do here with you today is to do a role play with the intervention. And we want to ask for at least two volunteers who have experienced natural disasters, because we're going to open it up for a natural disaster, not just a hurricane. So you can go through the experience and see what we did. And then three of our students are also going to role play some of what went through, so you can actually see it. So anyone? 
All right. Okay, coming over to the circle. Awesome. Who else? Oh, I need the microphone. Anyone else? One more? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, no, I said Anywhere you want to sit. Bessie, you want to play some music for us that we had? Do you have that? Okay. So we're going to be presenting this as a role play. Can you hear me? As a role play. Um, this intervention was made to last an hour to an hour and a half. We're not going to do the whole thing here. We're just going to do the core intervention and the planned um, some of the planned responses, so we don't want to make it that long. Um, okay, ready? So I don't think we have the music, but it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Did you live through a hurricane? Yes. What's your name? Mary Schulteis. Your name? Violet. Also a hurricane? A flood. Okay. Yeah. So different, but the impact could be the same and could be a lot of losses. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start with the welcoming all of you. It's what we would start doing and talk about how we all been through a natural disaster and how hard it's been for all of us. And, and always the facilitator includes themselves because we've all usually lived through it as well. And through, the ex through this exercise, we will have the opportunity to share the experience and provide support to each other. So let's set up some debrief guidelines. For example, you know what all the debrief guidelines are. For example, it's important that we use our empathic listening. That means we are attentive when others speak and do not interrupt. Okay. Can any of you think of another important guideline for the exercise? Yes. Yes, confidentially. Confidentiality, it's important, that's right. Anyone else? You also have to remember to speak from your own perspective, you know, the I slash my, and not to, you know, put down any deep, um, I mean, sorry. <laughs> like, not to, not to put, put down, like, uh, not to just lay it down without emotion, you know. So no put downs when others speak about their their um, experience. Very good. Anyone else? Think of any others? So usually the youths have already known their guidelines and the debrief guidelines, and we go through that. And we want to start. Um, we want to start being present and disconnecting from what we have to do. What, what we have to do after this? Wait a minute, because I've got my exercise over here. Sorry. So we're going to start by being present and disconnecting from what we had to do to get here, which could have been a hassle, or what we have to do afterwards. So we want to make ourselves comfortable. Let's not cross our legs. Um, you can take your shoes off if you want. And we can all participate in this if you need to, or if you want to. We can close our eyes. And we're going to do what it's called a body scan because everything that, we, that comes from our senses, our body feels too. We wanna start by checking with, in with your body, just as it is right now, noticing the sensations that are present, feeling the contact the body's making with the floor, the chair. Feel your weight anchored to the floor Let's also pay attention to our breathing and how our breaths moves throughout our bodies. We want to take a deep inhale and exhale. <sighs> then we want to start to scan the body, sweeping your awareness through different parts of the body without judging what you are aware but as best as you can, bringing attention to your experience moment to moment. 
We want to start with the soles of your feet, your toes, in between your toes, the top of your feet, ankles, and heel. Concentrate in each part. Do they feel hot or cold? Do they hurt? Are they numb or swollen? Can you feel the blood circulating through them? Don't judge why they might feel this way. Simply notice how they feel. Continue breathing. Inhale. Exhale. Wiggle your toes a little bit and be aware of how that feels. Once you have made a strong connection with your feet, move your attention upwards, past your ankle, switching all your focus from your feet to the lower legs. Then move onto your kneecaps, behind your knees, your thighs. Take your time. Shifting the focus now to the lower back, the lumbar spine, feeling the gentle pressure as the back meets the chair before moving your awareness to the pelvis area, the hip bones and sitting bones, noticing any sensations or lack of sensations that are here. Perhaps being aware of the breath in this part of the body. Then stretching your awareness to the abdomen and stomach the place where we feel gut feelings. Noticing your attitude to this part of your body, seeing if you can allow it to be as it is, taking a relaxed and accepting approach to this part of the body, bringing a kind attention here. If you notice your mind wandering, then this is perfectly natural. That's what minds do. Noticing your mind has wandered is a moment of awareness. Just gently guide your mind back to the part of the body you're focusing on and continue breathing. Now we're gonna keep moving up, turning your awareness now to the chest area. Noticing the subtle rise and fall of the chest with the in and out breath. Turning your awareness to the rib cage, front and back of the ribs, sides of the ribs. Breathe in and exhale. Now focus on the shoulders. The places where there is contact between the shoulders and the chair. Stretching your awareness into the arms, elbows, wrists, hands and fingers, aware of what is here in each moment. Move your attention through the length of the fingers and into the hands. Notice the tops of the hands as well as the palms. Now letting go of the hand, continue your body scan up your arm and at the shoulders, putting your attention to your neck, noticing the strong muscles in this part of the body, having awareness of any tension in the neck and throat, perhaps becoming aware of the sensation of the air in the throat, breathing in and out. Now move your attention to the head, including in awareness the forehead, Noticing whether or not you can feel the pulse in the forehead, whether there is tightness or ease. Then including the eyes, the nose, cheeks, mouth, chin, and finally the ears, including any sounds that you notice coming to the ears. Breathe in and out. Try to smile. Be aware of the sensations in your body. 
Be aware of your breath. Feel the connection in your body. Now, taking one deep breath. Widen your focus, feeling the whole body with awareness, noticing whatever is present, sweeping the body with your awareness from the top to the bottom, experiencing the body from the inside out. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. How are you feeling? Yeah. Have any of you done this exercise before? No, I, I have never done anything like this before. How did, did you like it? How did you feel before or after? Now I feel more relaxed. Okay. Okay, so now that we are present, let's briefly talk about the facts of the natural disaster. And at this point, what we would do is talk about all the facts of what happened. What happened in Puerto Rico is that most people, ha we didn't have power, no connection, so a lot of the youth didn't know what happened, didn't know the trajectory of the hurricane, they just knew by hearsay what the community was saying, how terrible, or so on, and so we wanted to give them the facts. It came from here, this was a category four, and we would do the same with whatever natural disaster that it's experiencing, it because it's important that they get the facts right. Um, we're going to express ourselves on paper. I want you to think about what you're experiencing during this event, your first impressions and your feelings, we will do this together and go each question one by one. I'm going to be giving one of, one of each to Carlos. Carlos, sorry. And Kenneth. This is yours. And this is for you. They should all have a pen. Do you have a pen? There you go. Okay, so we're going to go one by one. I'm going to be reading them to you and I'll give you time to answer. You can write or draw your answers. We will then go on to the next, and so on. We will then have time to share, okay? So go with me. What was your experience with this event? You may answer the first one. What did you experience first? How did you see or perceive it? Now let's go on to the next question, number two. What were your first impressions? What was your first thought during the event? What were you doing at different times while the event was happening? What did you hear, smell, see, or touch? You can write any of those. The next one, what were you feeling? You can write before, during, or after the event. Write down some of your feelings. And on the last one, number four, what did you learn from this experience? Can you remember or point to anything positive about it? Now let's open it up for sharing. Who would like to share their experience during the natural disaster? 
I was scared. I, I had to stay all the day taking water out of the house, and I stayed at my grandmother's house because it was, it was safer than mine. So you had to stay cleaning the house, taking water out, so you felt very scared. Anyone else? Well, uh, personally, I, uh, I slept through the event, but afterward, you know, I had my first impressions. It was, uh, it was pretty scary. After you woke up from the <laughs> Okay. Anyone else? It was horrible, very sad. The disaster that I was in was Katrina. It came in as a Category 5. The sun was out. It was shining. And it wasn't until the levee broke and we realized that the city was flooded. So it was just shock, just total shock that we were in New Orleans and just the rest of the world was just functioning so well. So it was just a shock. Shock from seeing all the destruction. I think we can all share that feeling as well. Mine was the flood of 1993. Um, we lost, my small town lost our entire community. So it was, even though we knew it was coming, we knew that the levees were going to break, you didn't know the impact. Um, I had happened to be a young kid hanging out with the National Guard because we knew it was coming. And, and about 9 o'clock that night, he told us to go ride our bikes home. The levee had just broke and that when we woke up, our world would be different. And boy, was it. Um, we luckily, our house didn't get destroyed that time, but you couldn't leave it or go to it. So there were no services. We were lucky that we were like one of a few houses that made it, but so you almost had that survivor guilt a little bit too. So I think it's important what you mentioned. You can prepare for it, but it's never what you think it is. And that's what happened in Puerto Rico as well with, like none of us had experienced, we experienced hurricanes yearly, but never to this magnitude for, or not for the past 90 years, like it was mentioned at the beginning. So, so that was hard as well. <clears throat> um, anyone else wants to share how they were feeling during the event? No? Okay. What about um, anything that you learned from the experience? Were you able to identify? I learned the importance of getting ready. I learned the importance of community, you know, coming together, um, the importance of, um, you know, the agencies that supported um, New Orleans at the time, so uh, just that together, you know, we all come together, we can accomplish a lot, so I think it strengthened our resiliency and our community partnerships. To value what we have and not take the things for granted. Mine was to follow emergency personnel's action plans. Um, a lot of I, I don't, not, a lot of loss of livestock and a lot of loss of things that, again, we knew for months that it was coming. So even thinking about, my grandparents put me to bed that night knowing that a flood was coming. We were lucky that we didn't, but the other people weren't, you know? So it's the following the emergency personnel's responses. Taking it seriously. Taking it seriously. Also, um, I also learned that even though we might not have a lot of resources at the time, we might be able to survive with limited um, technology, uh, power, water, and such. That was, that was a very common response of, of being able to survive without the basics. It's amazing, and the resilience, as you mentioned, also from the community. I think a lot of it for us was frustrated as well as um, I, not as terrible as Puerto Rico, but it took forever, years and years. And then to go to that small community, they never rebuilt. They never did anything. And it looks like a ghost town from, from forever. Um, so it's sad to see that, you know, it's very frustrated that one natural disaster wiped out an entire community. And some communities can never recover. Mm -hmm. And that's true too. Okay, good, great. So I want you to turn the page now. 
You know, we want to think about um, the fact that just like you, other youths around the world experience disasters. And if you could write a message of hope, what would it be? If you can think of anything. Maybe something that would have helped you when you felt. And how do you think is the best way to send this message? So anyone want to share what they wrote? Well, one of the things that you should always have in mind is that you shouldn't give up, and you should try to move forward as best you can, and how with the best of your ability. I wrote that we should have hope and faith. I would say to believe. Just always believe that um, you can rebuild, and know that together you can do it. I always believe in family, community, partnerships, um, that you can rebuild. You just have to believe and don't lose the faith and the hope. Lend in a hand and help your neighbor and community. Mine was um, learn from the past so that you can help rebuild your future. So what can you do differently? I mean, we can't stop hurricanes, but we can plan for how we can prepare ourselves for next time. And that same thing that he said is check on your friends and your neighbors and make sure that they're okay. How would you send this message? Does anyone have any ideas? How would you spread it around? Taking photos. Okay. Scrapbooks. I think that um, making videos, uh, you know, telling people how it is and, you know, making the videos, so fun. I would like to make a billboard school with the photos. I think just continuing to talk about it. And you know, it is part of our history and never letting go of what happened and just continuing to talk and share that information as much as possible with generation after generation. Great. So those were some great ideas. And what we were going to do is have another meeting and schedule another meeting to figure out how we're going to do that and make a video or do a scrapbook and get that going. And before we close today, um, I just want to do a little exercise for closure. Um, OK, so I'm going to put some rocks here in the middle, give you some markers as well that we brought, and they're all washed and clean. <laughs> we had that situation. Um, and I want you um, to look at those rocks in front of you. Rocks have been in this world before all of us. They're our ancestors. So, and I want you to, one by one, look at the rocks that calls your attention and pick the one that you feel it's for you. You can just go one by one. Okay, and we're gonna um, hold that, hold that rock with your hand, close your fist, and put it close to your heart. And think about, um, make a connection about what, what, that, what that rocks inspires you. If anything, what word in, inspires you? And when you have that word, we've got some markers here, and I want you to write on it. 
what the word is. You can pass him. Do you have any specific color you want? Okay. Get the black. Okay. And I want you to write that message in your rock. Mm-hmm. Does anyone want to share what they wrote? I wrote that we should have compassion because in that way we can help each other. I still have to believe, and so my word is believe. You need to have hope. Motivation, we have to get up and do something. And you need to be strong in order to overcome any uh, barriers that might come in the way of, you know, yeah, reforming and. Great messages. So what you can do with a rock, I want you to keep it for yourself, or if you want, you can share it with somebody, with one of your, um, friends or peers, or you can keep it to yourself, put it in your pocket. It's a good thing to have tangible for you when you do need that inspiration, when you do need to believe and keep strong and, and take action um, to look at it and keep it to yourself. And I really appreciate your participation. And I want a, a hand of applause for all the volunteers here. And so in a nutshell, in a very quick nutshell, this is what we did with our youths. We want to continue with our presentation now and open it up for questions later. So if you have any questions about the intervention or anything else that you want to um, comment or ask, we'll be open for that after the presentation. Because we want to tell you what, where we are right now. OK? Thank you for participating. I'm going to pick that up. So messages of hope um, were developed in many creative ways, yep. including decorated letters, posters, videos that were shared at schools, and even a group decorated the school's the Christmas day trees day. with ornaments that, that contain like the messages of hope, as you can see right here. Um, so us, as a Youth Advisory Council, compiled our, all of those um, messages of hope and created a video that we're going to see it right now. On 20th, 2017, Puerto Rico felt Hurricane Maria's destructive force. Unexpected challenging events and traumatic experiences affected all Puerto Ricans, but especially us, youth, during the event and afterwards. After the hurricane, we needed a way to express ourselves and let out all the feelings and sentiments that came up along the way. The Puerto Rico Title V Adolescent Health Program developed a strategy to provide a safe and secure space where we could ventilate our feelings and work towards healing. To start, a grounding exercise was done to help us connect with our body and mind and prepare ourselves to share what we went through. Then, we each reflected and wrote down our thoughts, first impressions, and overall feelings. We were also asked to mention what we learned from the experience and what positive things we could recall. This led us to exercise empathy and connect with others, developing messages of hope. These messages convey the resiliency, solidarity, and hope of the youth in Puerto Rico. More than 500 of our youth aged from 11 to 24 years in the Youth Health Promoters Project and Youth Advisory Council from all over the island created their messages and shared them in multiple ways. Durante el huracán María, me sentí triste, ansiosa, y preocupada por lo que le pudiera pasar a mi familia y a mi hogar. Esta experiencia fue un poco impactante al ver cómo mi familia se trepaba el techo por miedo de ahogarse. Y lo importante es que estamos vivos. Recuerdo, todo obra para bien, así que para adelante, Boricua. Que es todos unidos, en paz, podemos lograr la estabilidad de Puerto Rico. Me sentí del huracán 
ansioso, nervioso y con poco miedo. Ya, yeah, oh, pero cuando los, el huracán estaba soplando, no estaba viendo el océano y sintiendo el viento fresquito. Y en la situación me relajé un poquito, aunque todavía preocupado. En estos momentos nos encontramos en un proceso de recuperación, donde nuestra fortaleza y perseverancia tiene que salir a flor de piel, donde los momentos que hemos pasado los tenemos que utilizar como motor de esperanza, como ese motor que nos va a ayudar a ser mejores personas y nos va a ayudar a estar presentes en la vida de los demás. Esa es la palabra, estar presente. Estar presente es para apoyar, para ayudar y para hacer de nuestro vecino nuestro amigo. Me sentía inseguro, pues porque no sabía nada de mi familia, estábamos incomunicados. Y el miedo a que los perdiera, pues me inundó aquel día. A la gente que sufrió ese día, que lo perdieron todo, que tuvieron que empezar desde cero, les digo que no están solos. Y ese día nos dimos cuenta que a quienes tenemos realmente es a nuestros hermanos, a nuestros vecinos. Tenemos a Alboricua, que es un guerrero incansable. Como diría Virgilio Dávila, ese día aprendimos a amar a nuestra tierra. Y a pesar de que quedó desolada, vamos a volver a florecer. El 20 de septiembre, el huracán María azotó fuertemente nuestra isla. Al momento del huracán sentí tristeza, ansiedad, miedo, dolor por la familia, mis amistades, por mi hogar. Y les queremos decir que tengan fuerza, que no hay más que por bien no venga. ¿Y qué? ¡Puerto Rico se levanta! The Puerto Rico Title V Adolescent Health Program translated and adapted the hope after Hurricane's lesson plan from the Alliance for Climate Education. Um, I just want to really quickly say where we are right now. No. So what we've collected from those forms and, that, and the questions that you filled out in the intervention, we've collected all of those, and we're making sense of those insights that the youth um, wrote. Some wrote, some drew great drawings. And our goal is to describe, analyze, and interpret that information in a systematic, flexible, inductive method. So we're doing a qualitative analysis of all that information that we want to share with um, other departments, with the Department of Education, for example, see what they, what they um, need to do differently. And these are some of the things um, that they've experienced. These were some of the drawings. As you can see, um, this exercise allowed youth to share their experiences and emotions in a safe place through discussion, writing, and storytelling. And some of the sessions lasted more than one day, not like we did here. We, went, we moved really quickly in all the exercises, so I just wanted you guys to know that that was different. Um, and some of the basic themes that we keep hearing, some sadness, Fear, shock, like you mentioned, very, very common. Um, some, of the, some of the youth would say, I was in the bathroom with my family for seven hours. It was cold and windy. I was very scared. When I saw the destruction in my house and nature, it broke my heart. It seemed to be the end of the world. Some of the descriptions. And what they've learned, which is also important, it's solidarity. Um, with the community, with the family, being prepared. And a lot of them had the opportunity to play board games again and go out in the streets and play with the neighbors. That was very common. Um, like, that's not something that they usually do, and it's because they don't have any other electronics or um, other things to do that the community um, 
stayed outside. And some of the messages to inspire others, hope, motivation, faith, as we, ha as we heard here. Um, and so that's where we are right now. Um, I don't know if you, you wanted to mention. Where are we now? One and a half uh, uh, years after the hurricane, uh, we are still recovering. There are still some places without any electricity, and there are many houses with the blue tarps instead of roofs. But we are rising up. Some of the youth health promoters that came to the States or uh, another place, they are returning. And the youth, advice, the, uh, the youth health promoters are meeting again. This is two pictures of last month where they were promoting health in their schools. So we wanted to share this experience with you so that you can have a model that you can use in, in any time you, can, you have a natural disaster and you're working with youth. Jews are very important. We need to work with them to understand how they are feeling and to help them overcome the emotions they feel. So we thank you very much for your presence here. And um, I will ask Marianela to come over. Do you have any, any questions, any comments? I want to hear about the volunteers and how they felt doing the exercise even years after a natural disaster. Oh, if you want to tell us a little bit. I just think for me, you know, um, it's like you said, disaster, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, disasters are happening all over the world. And that um, one thing that I learned too is that, you know, even though we're in different places and different parts of the world, we really do care. I mean, we, we really do care what happens. And so uh, we thank everyone across the world who, who was looking down on New Orleans at the time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and seeing what was happening. And we, I want, if I never had a chance to say it now, I want to thank, thank you all. So many people uh, evacuated to other states, um, other parts of the world, and, and they were received with open arms. And so I want to say thank you. Yeah, that's great. How about? I think as professionals, we need to remember to do this work. I was a 14-year-old kid that got no services. We worried about building our community. Um, it was in the middle of the summer, so schools were already down, but we didn't have power. We didn't have electricity. Yeah, we played, um, but no one checked on us. Mm -hmm. They made sure we had food. The Red Cross came in once a day and gave us a bunch of pro you know, processed foods, and, and, but no one ever came in to say, how are you doing, Violet? I was terrified. Um, I was afraid that I was going to go to bed and I was going to wake up and drown. Or, you know, I still have, I don't like the smell of mud because I'm sure you guys know the smell, you know, that's a that's weird thing to be adverse reaction to. But this, you know, I, the first time I had a small pipe leak in my house, I cried for two days because I thought I moved out of a flood zone. And that's and, and that's what zone. happens when um, trauma when when we don't ask exactly. when we don't process and great and all great the people in my community will say that because you just didn't think about the kids it was you how do we get that roof back on how do we get those services back on it's not how are you feeling today and we need that because we're going to graze adults that are not prepared to to handle natural disasters exactly thank you thank you for that. Yes, and we're going to have all these um, forms and the entire model of intervention as links. If any of you are interested, we can share that. Um, first of all, thank you for um, sharing your experience. It was um, unbelievable. <laughs> uh, my question to you is, due to the challenges that, many challenges that you had with the transportation, with uh, spreading the word, how were you able to get from region to region to try to organize these um, events? It was hard. I don't know if you want to comment on that. But we, oh, mm -hmm. Well, you know, roads, some of the roads were, this, were, were broken. Some of the bridges also. Schools were closed. 
for until November, from, from September up to two months. But it, it, schools began to close as they were recovering. So the uh, coordinators continue working with the communities, even though the schools were closed, they were looking for those youth that were in the Youth Health Promoters Project and were, uh, and we ha and were helping other people too. So once the schools, uh, each school opened and we had the, the project there, they would move and, and do the intervention so that they could handle, they could ventilate, so that they could move so that we can come to, to back again to start with the, with the curriculum we already had. So it was not easy, but our coordinators are very committed, very committed with youth and their families. And even though some of them have lost their homes, they left their families and went to work with all the Jews. So we appreciate that very much from them. The, the work of the first responders was amazing from the communities. So they, they were there. Then they went to the schools, and that's where they got, they saw the children. And that's why we have different coordinators around the island, so the one from the east doesn't have to go to the west side. So, so we have time for only one more question. I know, I know. I know. Or comment. Or comment. Or ex quick comment. Yes. Uh, um, so I've done crisis response in Louisiana um, for most of my career. And in Louisiana, it takes a very long time after the crisis. I do mental health crisis counseling. And um, I mean, months, sometimes a year after the accident. So what sped up your process that maybe we'd be able to replicate? I don't, what sped up the process? I, I really, when we, were, when we were talking about this and putting this up, I really don't know how we did it. Starting in November, I mean, I didn't, I didn't get power in my house till December, late December. So we were doing this work. Just, I think, I mean, if you know about trauma, what we know is we need to take action, and that's what we had to do. We couldn't stay and do nothing, so we, we moved along. I, I don't know how we did it, really. A lot of commitment, a lot of, um, but it would help. That's why we're bringing this model, because I think it would help to have the model already, so you, you, you don't have to look for it and redo it and reinvent it, so. I think that we knew we didn't, can go back to the program to three years and the model, because we all suffer for this. And we needed to take a stop and think about ourselves. But also, we, we give the option to the youth. If you don't want to do this intervention, we can go back and talk about sexuality and everything. But, the they're, but they're health promoters. You can't promote health if you're not, you know, if you don't know where you're at. <laughs> well, thank you all for sharing your strength, resiliency, and just all of your light that you, you know, persevered through this. I, this is so inspiring. And I feel like this is a model of true healing that should be used in all public health practices in any trauma because there's so much, you know, that the world is going through and that in ancestral trauma. And I think this is just such a beautiful and strong way to come together and truly make an impact in our thank young you. people. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. So we thank you for those words. We want to give a special thanks to our youth promoters and coordinators for that time, also our youth advisors, and especially to the persons that are working with us, our colleagues in the MCH division and youth that are working doing the analysis we just told you. So if you want to contact us or download all the instruments we use here, the tools are in Spanish and English, so it's for everybody. And you can download it in that uh, link you have there, okay? Thank you, I think we are out of time. Thank you so much for being here. And if you have any more questions, you can come over here. Thank you.